Hi everyone, it's Mr. Hamilton here, and today we're going to look at completely inelastic collisions. Elastic collisions occur when momentum and kinetic energy are both conserved. Now, energy is always conserved, but in elastic collisions, kinetic energy itself is conserved. In the case of an inelastic collision, that's really any other type of collision. So we rarely ever see true elastic collisions um, in real life. In fact, even billiards is really not fully an elastic collision because some energy is converted into sound um, and vibrations and things like that. So almost any every collision is inelastic. And then if we have a completely inelastic collision, it means that the two objects stick together. So that's the thing to remember there. We have inelastic collisions all around us, completely inelastic collisions, they stick together. So let's look at an example of a ballistic pendulum. And we're going to use this to find the speed of a bullet. Now you say, well, can't I just hold out a radar gun? Well, I wouldn't get that in the way, that's for sure. Um, and I'm sure there's other ways to do this, but this is one way that we could use this model. Maybe not the most practical way to do it, but it's just one way that would show how that works. So here we have a ballistic pendulum. It's going to hang from a couple of ropes from the ceiling or something and what we're going to do is we are going to take a gun and we're going to shoot a bullet going at some velocity into this mass and it's going to stick into this mass and what's going to happen is that is going to swing up to some place it's going to swing up to something like this and we're going to have it result at some height there and the distance between here and here that is the change in height so we're recognizing that somehow we're going to have to take the velocity the bullet's moving at and turn it into the height at which this pendulum is going to swing. So we'll introduce a few givens and then we'll do some math on this. The givens that we'll have here is that the height will be 0.15 meters. Um, we're also going to introduce the idea that this mass of the pendulum is 5.00 kilograms. The mass of the bullet will be 0 0.050 kilograms. We'll call this mass 1, we'll call this mass 2, and then obviously the bullet's coming out of the muzzle of the gun, which we could draw on there, we don't need to do that. So this is the before it starts to swing, and this is the after it's swung up. Other than that, we have no other information given in this question that, I, that needs to be given. We now need to make a strategy to solve this. And the first thing we want to do is recognize that two things are at play. The first thing that's happening is that there is a transfer of momentum transfer of momentum from the bullet to the pendulum. The second thing that we want to recognize is that there's a transfer of energy of energy from um, kinetic energy of the pendulum to the gravitational potential energy of the pendulum because it's got to rise some distance at which point it stops. So the assumption that we make in all these questions is that there's no other energy lost. Obviously there's sound energy and maybe vibrational energy, but we assume here that all the EK that it has after the bullet hits the, the pendulum transfers into kinetic into gravitational potential energy. So with that in mind, we, could, we need to make a strategy for how we're going to solve this. And so if you think about these two parts, let's move this up here. Part one, because if we're transferring momentum, we're, we're going to say that the uh, momentum total that I had initially has to be equal to the total momentum that I have later. And then part two, we have to say that the gravitational potential energy that I had later is equal to the kinetic energy that I had earlier. So those are our two things that we need to work off of here. Now, as we'll find, we aren't going to have enough to work on one. We're actually going to kind of reverse engineer this and work backwards to figure out the speed because we're given that final value of the height, which is going to allow us to work back to find the speed because ultimately, this is the speed that we want right here, the velocity of 1, and we don't know it, and we'll see that we need to reverse engineer it to get that. 
So let's break it down to see how this works. So we get P1 plus P2 because the bullet is moving. Uh, this is zero because originally the mass is not moving, the pendulum is not moving at all. And then what we're going to do is we're going to eventually get to a point where the pendulum, call this 1 and 2, combine moving together. So all we have in the initial case is that M1, V1 is going, that's the only movement we have. The, the momentum of the pendulum is zero. But after the collision, so again, this is looking at before the collision and then after the collision. After the collision, we're going to get uh, M12, the mass, because the bullet is going to be stuck in the pendulum, times the velocity of that entire pendulum primed. And so uh, we can see here that we, we know that mass, we know that mass. We don't know this. This is ultimately what we're trying to find. And we also don't know this velocity at which the pendulum is going to swing. So we get to a point where we're stuck with two unknowns and we move on to the next thing that we can do. So over here, we know that the kinetic energy is this. And we know that gravitational potential energy is this. And we can go ahead and put the equations in that we know, or the things in that I know. In particular, I know that this final velocity, we can rewrite that as v12 primed, because that's the final velocity, um, not, or sorry, that's the initial velocity as it begins to swing. So after the bullet has hit it, that's our velocity. So let's just go ahead and write this as such. This is mass of 1 and 2 as well. It's the mass of them combined, because um, this energy transfer is considered after the bullet hits, um, at the very beginning before it swings, and then after it swings at the top. So we're going to have 1 half m12 v12 primes is equal to m12 g change in height. And so I know everything I need here to solve for this velocity right here, or the speed. I should have squared it there. Um, so here we go. We're going to multiply both sides by 2. We are going to divide both sides by pen working there. We can divide both sides by m12, so that's going to cancel out. This is going to give me v12 primed all squared. So we take the square root of both sides, and we get v12 primed, and what that's equal to. So it's equal to, in this particular case, it's 2 times 9.81 meters per second squared is our gravitational constant. Uh, our height is 0.15 meters. If it said 15 centimeters, you change that to meters by dividing by 100, obviously. Uh, and then we just divide that by 1. We don't really need to divide it by anything because the masses cancel. Um, so we go ahead and we calculate that, V12 primed. And what we get is a value of 1.71552 meters per second. And the reason I've kept so many extra significant digits is because I've not yet done that. I have to go back over here. Now, clearly that's going to be in the positive direction because we're, we're moving forwards. Um, I could have said that this is forwards and positive. So that, that goes in as a positive number, which it always will in a case like this. Um, and I can solve for V1. V1 is equal to the mass of 1, 2 combined times V1, 2 primed divided by mass 1. So V1 is equal to, combined is 5.050 kilograms. And then we found the velocity to be 1.71552 meters per second. And we're going to divide that by the first mass, which was 0 0.050 kilograms. And now we get a number that's much bigger that we would expect, because clearly that wasn't the speed over here of the gun, uh, the bullet coming from the gun, rather. Uh, here we get a value of 173 meters per second. So we can conclude, therefore, the bullet uh, hit the pendulum, or came from the gun, it depends how long it was flying through the air, at a speed of 173 meters per second. You could also say it's 173 meters per second forwards if it's asking for the velocity. So there's, there's what we have to do. We have to recognize two things, the transfer of momentum from bullet to the pendulum and the transfer of energy from the, gravi from the kinetic to the gravitational potential. And then when we've solved one piece of it, put it in the other equation to solve that one.
So there's the muzzle velocity that, that's often called to the muzzle velocity of the, of the bullet. Let's do one more example. Here's our second example. A car mass of 1,200 kilograms traveling at 11.0 meters per second rear ends another car mass of 1,400 kilograms at a stoplight. The other car is stopped. I don't recommend this. The two cars stick together and slide 10 meters before coming to a stop. Determine the coefficient of kinetic friction between the two cars in the road. Now you might look at this and actually begin to think this is actually really practical and this is something that um, a certain, if you're in the police force, you might be analyzing accidents and this is the kind of thing you would do. You would be able to see the uh, skid marks on the road and you'd be able to determine based on a little bit of physics how fast that car was actually traveling. In this particular case, it's asking us for the coefficient of kinetic friction. We're obviously assuming that each of the cars is going to have the same coefficient of kinetic friction between them, tires in the road. Um, well, let's actually figure out what we would do in this particular case. We want to think about it in terms of before, during, and after. And so before that accident actually happens, we can clearly know that there's one car coming with some velocity towards the other one. We'll call this the mass one. And mass one is 1,400 kilograms, 1,200 kilograms rather. The velocity that it's moving at um, is 11 meters per second. And, and you'll notice that everything here is going to be in the positive direction. So I'm not going to worry about directions. I'm just going to say it's, or vectors here, it's all going to be forwards. Uh, we know as well that the other car, mass two, is 1,400 kilograms in weight, or in mass. During the accident, what happens is the two of them collide, and once the one has hit the other, they lock and slide together with some new velocity. Call this velocity V total. We don't know what it is, but we know that the mass of this entire situation is 2,600 kilograms. We know that momentum is always conserved. So that's what we're using when we compare the before and the during with any of these situations. After the collision has happened, eventually this comes to a stop where these two cars stop some distance from where they started. So there's where it started. There's where it started. Um, and so this distance here, from here to here, is a distance of 10 meters. We call this delta D is 10.0 meters. So great, we've got the situation mapped out. Now let's go ahead and actually plan out what we're going to do. The before to during, just like that last problem that we saw, is where we compare the momentum. We know the initial momentum, the total momentum that I started with, is the total momentum that I finished with. And so we have, in this particular case, the momentum of car one plus the momentum of car two, which again, the momentum there is zero, is equal to the momentum of car one and two combined, just like before. We can break that down as M1 times V1 is equal to M12 times V12 primed. Again, I said I'm not, I, I, I could add vectors there. I don't need them in this case because everything's forwards, but I'll keep them to be consistent here. And we want to think this out just like we did um, in the last question, not just follow the same formula because we should recognize here that we actually know this velocity in this case. So in this particular case, I can solve for this speed because that's going to be important for me to actually find the coefficient of friction. I'm actually working forwards through the given values in this question, not backwards like the last one. So think out what you have. Don't just follow the steps, but actually think it out. So we, uh, we can rearrange this for V1 of 2, or V1 and 2 primed. And it's going to be M1 times V1 divided by M12. And when I sub those values in, I know that the mass of the first car was 1,200 kilograms. I know that the speed of the first car was 11 meters per second. And I know that I'm dividing this by a value of 2,600, because that was also the total mass. So whether you think about it in terms of mass 1, 2 combined, or total mass, it's the same thing, obviously. And the value that we get here is a velocity of 5.07892 meters per second. 5.07892 meters per second. And that's positive forwards, as we already stated. 
So as we saw in the last question, the same is true here, that the momentum is measured from before the collision happens to during it happening, to when they stick together. So that's where we have, that's what's conserved. Momentum is always conserved in that process, going from before to during. It's once they're stuck together that we can move to conservation of energy. And in this particular case, we can say that the kinetic energy that I had initially is equal to the work that's done by friction. Kinetic energy I had initially is equal to work done by friction. And the kinetic energy that I had is one half times the total mass, because remember that this initial is referring to the, this second diagram when they're now stuck together, times the total velocity squared. And then that we know that any work that's done is the force of friction, or in this case, kinetic friction, times the displacement that that object moves. And if they're in the same direction, then the, it's just the force times the displacement, no uh, cosine be, it doesn't need to be multiplied there. So then it's a matter of that point of saying, well, how do I find the um, coefficient of friction? Well, we need to break this down and remind ourselves that force of kinetic friction is mu k times f of n. And since there's no acceleration up or down, we can also conclude that that means that the force of kinetic friction is equal to mu k mg, which is the force of gravity. And so we can now substitute that in for our force of kinetic friction and solve for that coefficient. So we get one half the total mass times Vt squared is equal to mu k mg times delta d. And divide both sides by the mass times gravity times delta d. Keep in mind this is the total mass, total mass there. Um, that's all going to cancel out that side if I divide the other side by this. Total mass times g times delta d. I don't need the mass at all for the energy part of the calculations, but I do need it for the momentum part of the calculation. So keep that in mind. That is important to have. So that's going to cancel out. So mu k is going to be equal to 1 half times vt squared divided by, or you could put the division like this, g delta d. And so it's vt squared divided by 2 times g delta d. If we continue on subbing that in, the total velocity squared was 5.07892. Don't forget to square it. We know that g is 9.81 meters per second squared. And we know that the change in displacement, or the, the displacement in this case, is 10 meters forwards. Uh, what we end up at a value of the coefficient of friction, we know it needs to be between 0 and 1. So it better be something that makes sense. And lo and behold, we get a value of 0.13, which is quite low for rubber on pavement. So maybe this is a wet day, or maybe this is a day with a lot of ice or snow on the road. But there, we found our coefficient of kinetic friction. It is 0.13. And we conclude, therefore, the coefficient of kinetic friction is that. So just to recap really quickly, the strategy that we're using is we're thinking about just before something hits the other thing, and then when it actually hits and combines, that's the momentum part, and then we consider the energy once they're combined and once they start to move. So those are the two pieces, and then you basically have to figure out how those two pieces fit together in order to solve the different questions. All the best.